over my head. I hear music in the air over my head. My name is Kathy Hambrick, and I am the founder of the River Road African American Museum, and I am the former curator and director of interpretation here at the West Baton Rouge Museum. And I want to welcome you to the juke joint here at the West Baton Rouge Museum, which was actually designed uh, to represent the places here on the west bank of the Mississippi River. Um, that would have been found in the sugarcane fields. Uh, for those of you who don't know, you're in the heart of sugarcane country on the west bank of the Mississippi River in Port Allen, Louisiana, West Baton Rouge Parish, which was actually the home of Don Lemon's family uh, with CNN. So when I was hired to um, work here at the West Baton Rouge Museum in 2017, one of the first projects that was assigned to me was to turn this old Boy Scout hut into a juke joint. And the idea came from Kenny Neal, who is the son of blues musician Rafael Neal, who actually gave Buddy Guy, the famous Buddy Guy uh, of Chicago, his first job when Buddy Guy uh, lived in Letsworth, Louisiana, which is also here on the west bank of the river, but up in Point Coupee Parish. So for those of you who don't know where Point Coupee is, you may have heard of New Roads. So Letsworth is just north of New Roads, which is just north of Port Allen. So this place um, pays homage to the music that became a part of American culture, uh, the music that evolved from the Africans who played some of those same rhythms that we hear in blues music, that evolved from the work songs of the sugarcane fields and the cotton fields of uh, Louisiana, as well as Mississippi, uh, the music that became gospel music, the music that evolved into ragtime. And for those of you who don't know, that first music that the jazz musicians like Louis Armstrong and Jelly Roll Morton played, which they called the blues. They called their music the blues until someone else came along and decided to call it jazz. So these juke joints are part of the evolution of American music. And for those of you who are music aficionados or study uh, American music, it eventually evolved into rhythm and blues and then evolved into um, the music that we know as soul music of the 70s. And the music of the 60s, rock and roll. So one of the most famous musicians from West Baton Rouge Parish was Slim Harpo, whose real name is James Moore. As a matter of fact, he's pictured right there, <laughs> right there and also on the poster behind me. And Slim Har Harpo grew up in the sugarcane fields around here in West Baton Rouge Parish, a little community called Mulatto Bend, which if you look from the levee of Mulatto Bend, right across the river, you would be standing on the bluffs of Southern University. So some people want to know, well, why did they call that Mulatto Bend? And it's because it was a settlement of free people who lived in this deep curve of the Mississippi River. And when the riverboat captains would pass this part of the river on the west side of Baton Rouge, they would see these people of color. And so it became known as Mulatto Bend. So that was the home of Slim Harpo. Um, 
Slip Harpo became one of the most famous blues musicians of all time, playing the harmonica and opening for the Rolling Stones. There's an image of Mick Jagger here uh, in the museum because I want people who visit this museum from all over the world to understand that rock and roll evolved from blues music. And Mick Jagger and U2 and uh, Pink Floyd and so many of these rock and roll bands that became famous um, would cover the music of these blues musicians like Slim Harpo. Mick Jagger in Rolling Stone magazine asked this question in an interview. Why would you want to hear me sing or hear us, the Rolling Stones, play I Am a King Bee when you can hear the real thing from Slim Harpo? So Slim Harpo, James Moore, opened for the Rolling Stones uh, for several years before passing away. The men who played in the places like this with, these, with this tin roof and these wooden floors, um, they worked in the sugarcane fields. If they didn't cut cane, their parents cut cane, their grandparents cut cane, and then they also became the truck drivers and the tractor drivers in the cane fields. Slim Harpo, like many of these other men, Lazy Lester, Henry Gray, uh, Silas Hogan, they were janitors at the oil refineries on the, on the river. So they had day jobs, but at night, they were able to, as we say, hustle some more money, acorns. <laughs> okay, Slim, okay, Slim, all right, Slim. <laughs> so, um, you know, they had day jobs because these men took care of their families. Even though they were musicians, we must remember that these were men who took care of their families by being those janitors, cane cutters, truck drivers, and longshoremen on the river. But at night, they would travel the countryside during the Jim Crow era where I think about them being in cars and trucks, going from one juke joint to another, um, and the risk that they must have taken during that time, during the time of lynching and the Jim Crow era. They took care of their families by playing music, harmonicas, guitars, upright pianos and making whatever money that they could and providing a place for our people to let their hair down and have a good time after a hard day's work in the sugarcane fields. The word juke actually is derived from an African word juke, J-O-O-K. It evolved into J-U-K-E and it means to dance. So it was places like this where the men who played the blues, places like this where they came to meet their girlfriends, where they would bring their wives. I think about how many people, how many courtships took place in buildings like that, like this. And so as I design this exhibit, Every inch, every picture, every record, every bit of these walls and chairs that are part of this place reminds me of the love, the lovers that sat at these tables, drinking Slitz beer, Jack's beer, Falstaff beer, JB. <laughs> Uh, Tangeray, Singrams. Um, I interviewed people from all around West Baton Rouge who remembered coming into these places to have a drink after cleaning houses, being maids, being janitors, being lawn 
men cutting grass and that very, very, very hard and hot work of working in the sugar refineries and working in the sugar cane fields. As a part of my research, I also talked to people about the names of some of those dances that they would do in the juke joint. So dances like the hully gully, swing out, the mashed potatoes, the jitterbug. So there's a television here behind the bar where I also curated some old film footage of dances that were done in, in juke joints. You can find them easily on, on YouTube. So I would like to invite the young people who um, get a chance to see this exhibit to look at some of those dances. You know they say history repeats itself. And you will see that this music seems to come from our souls in Africa, from our ancestors in Africa. Those rhythms, those beats, those notes played on the ngoni that became the guitar. Um, I think about that music, and we listen to that music here at the Juke Joint in West Baton Rouge Parish. We oftentimes hear that when the Africans were brought across the Atlantic and brought to the Americas and put to work on these plantations that they could not play drums you know, one of the most traditional instruments of the African people were, were the drums, talking drums. We know through the study of music in New Orleans that Congo Square was one of the very few places in the world or in the Americas where Africans were allowed to play their drums. On the plantations, even though they could not play the drums, they remembered those rhythms. And there is a tradition that evolved where they would play rhythms with their hands on their thighs, on their chest. They would make these rhythms and beats. And whenever they were in the privacy of their own cabins, they could sing and play these rhythms with their hands, with their feet, tapping their feet, clapping their hands. Um, so the music came through the rhythms that transitioned with the people who ended up working on the plantations. The ngoni is an African instrument that looks like a guitar made out of a gourd. And it's a string instrument that dates back centuries in West African uh, traditions of Mali and uh, Benin. And if you look at this in Goni, you can see that it is an ancient version of what became the banjo, which then evolved into the guitar. So if you're able to see those instruments side by side, you can clearly understand how from Africa, from an African string instrument to a banjo, to the guitar, how the music evolved through instruments and then eventually through song. When you listen to the music, the work songs that were sang in the fields of the sugarcane fields and the cotton fields, so the work songs that were sung in the field to help um, our ancestors get through the hardship of the day, those work songs evolved into the gospel music and the spiritual music, Negro spirituals, that um, has become an important part of African, African American culture also. So the blues started in Africa, and as people um, were brought to Louisiana um, and Mississippi, it didn't start in Mississippi. How can you say, was it birth in Mississippi, the blues? On what day was the blues actually founded? This was music that was a part of our spirit. And I say it traveled from the south to the north 
to places like Chicago, primarily because of the Mississippi River. So as these men played more and more of their music in juke joints like this, they realized they could make more money by going to the big city. They ended up in New Orleans. They traveled upriver, driving north on Highway 61 through the crossroads of the Mississippi Delta. And they ended up just like Buddy Guy and B.B. King in Chicago. And so now Chicago is probably one of the major cities in the north that became famous for the blues. Juke joints were segregated. So these were black owned establishments, many times owned by women who were the entrepreneurs and the business women who sold bootleg beer, bootleg liquor. Um, they um, usually would have a, a pistol under the counter. They were rough places now. They were very, very rough places on any Saturday night or Friday night. Someone, I was told back in those days, people might not be shot at the juke joint, but it was very likely that someone would get cut. So pocket knives were popular. Most of the fights took place over a woman. Disputes about love. You think in terms of the blues, a lot of times we say, oh, I don't like that music because it's too sad. You know, they're singing about, um, you know, hard work, hard times, bad times. Oh, that music is so sad. But I've interviewed a number of blues men and I've listened to enough of the lyrics of the songs. And a lot of the blues is about women. Love lost, broken hearts. So these are men singing about love. So I would like to encourage um, the young people to listen to the lyrics because these men were telling stories. They were like the griots of Africa. They are like Common and Lizzo today. We're telling stories about love, about hard times, about good times. And I really think you probably could learn a lot about black history and the black community by listening to the lyrics of the song. Don't just listen to the beat. Listen to the lyrics and what the musicians are really trying to tell you about life in the black community. So I was asked, or I asked the question, why would you join so popular? on the west side of the river as opposed to in Baton Rouge. And what I was reminded of is that Baton Rouge had blue laws. So throughout the South, there are towns that had blue laws, which meant that you could not sell liquor on Sunday. And that if you owned an establishment that sold liquor and played live music, you had to close at midnight on Saturday night. West Baton Rouge Parish had no blue laws. So the nightclubs, well, the juke joints that evolved into nightclubs could stay open 24 hours, just like New Orleans. So there are musicians like Ernie Cato, um, whose father was actually from West Baton Rouge Parish also, who would come up from New Orleans and play in the juke joints here because they could play on Friday night or Thursday night in a juke joint up here in the country and then go and play in, in a larger city um, like New Orleans on Saturday night and make, make more money. Um, there is a man that I met in Ascension Parish named Douglas Turner Ward. And Douglas Turner Ward was the founder of the Negro Ensemble Theater, which did the first broad off-Broadway plays for African-Americans in the 1950s. You've probably heard of A Raisin in the Sun. Um, just about every African-American actor from Denzel Washington 
to Samuel L. Jackson, went to theater school through the Negro Ensemble Theater that Douglas Turner Ward started. Douglas was born on a plantation in Ascension Parish in the middle of the sugarcane fields. And he told me a story once that his father and his grandfather were bootleggers. And he would go as a little boy into the woods for them to check on the whiskey that they were brewing. And he said that his father moved to New Orleans because the sheriff threatened to lock, lock his grandfather up. So they left the rural area to get away from these small communities where lynching was more prominent, segregation, and hard times were pretty bad in these little towns. So people moved to the city, like Douglas Turner Ward, who from New Orleans, at the age of 13, by the time he was 16, moved to New York. So um, you think about the great migration, people moving to Kansas City. We find the jazz going to Kansas. We find jazz going to New York. And many of those people left the South looking for a better way of life, jobs that paid more money, and less harsh times and segregation by going to New York and Chicago. In the sugarcane fields here in Louisiana, I want you to understand, first of all, there were not sharecroppers on the sugarcane fields. The sharecropping system worked for tobacco and cotton, but it didn't work in sugarcane because sharecropping meant that I give you an acre of land, you and your family work this acre of land, and I take a part of the proceeds from whatever you grow as the landowner, the white landowner, I take a part of the proceeds from what you grow, I deduct your rent, I have a commissary or a store on the plantation, so everything is deducted out of your pay based upon what you grow on that one acre of land. Sugar requires you cannot yield enough sugar from an acre of sugar cane for that type of system to work here in Louisiana. So it was more of a tenant farming situation. You live on the property, I give you your flour, your sugar, your milk, your dry goods, you work here and uh, you live here, but you can never really get ahead. If you made $5 a month and I'm deducting $3 a month for your rent in this shack and a dollar a month for your shoes, your flour, your butter, your eggs that you're buying at the commissary, you could never get ahead. So a lot of people became very, very fed up with this system of tenant farming. Um, and they moved to the North, expecting to go to a better life. But then finding themselves working in the factories and um, finding also that the North had segregation. So um, I will say this, though, for the musicians that left Louisiana and Mississippi, they were able to bring family members north also. Uh, the money that was made in the juke joint by the women who operated these establishments and the men who operated these establishments provided money to pay tuition for a lot of your parents and grandparents. So the schools like Southern University, Leland College, Dillard University, Xavier, Tuskegee, I can guarantee you that it was many of your aunts and uncles and grandparents that had a jar on the side that helped to pay the tuition of your grandparents who were the first to get an education. 
So, you know, juke joints were also used for political rallies. So you couldn't talk about politics while you're working in the cane fields. You couldn't talk really at all. You're working. You were not allowed to talk while you're working. Um, but at night in the juke joints, um, there, was, uh, there were oftentimes back rooms, not only where they shot dice and played cards and gambled, but they were also able to have some of those, those political rallies where they could talk about who you would vote for, um, the injustices um, that might have been taking place in town, um, what was going to be the strategy to go to a march or a sit-in. So the juke joints were the private place that our ancestors could talk and plan and make their political strategies in buildings like this. So they weren't just a party place. Um, the men and women who operated these juke joints were able to get money to the NAACP and to SNCC and to some of those early uh, organizations um, throughout the South. They were able to fund people going on the march on going to the march on Washington. And so um, these were very, very important establishments in our community. They were not just a place where we came to party and dance and listen to the music. This juke joint ends a tour here at the West Baton Rouge Museum and the tour is called Cutting Cane Ain't All We Do. So the tour starts in the slave cabin, an 1850s era actual cabin that was at the Allendale Plantation. So when you go into that cabin and you walk through the rooms and you see the moss mattress on the floor and you realize as you listen to the slave narratives in that cabin that we were not even allowed to pray in groups when we were enslaved. The cabin was our place of solace. And if you had to put a pot, an iron pot in the middle of the floor and kneel down close to that pot with water in that pot to absorb the vibrations of your prayers. If you couldn't pray in groups at the plantation, you know that your freedom was limited. You could sing on some of the plantations, you could sing a field song while cutting the cane, but you were not allowed to gather in groups of more than three or four. You were constantly being watched and monitored. It was through the music that the songs of the Underground Railroad evolved. Steal Away is one of the most popular songs that were that was saying, you know, uh, steal away, um, go down, oh, swing, swing low, sweet chariot. The songs of the Underground Railroad, we had coded hidden messages in those songs that they thought we were, they thought we were just singing to have a good time while we were working or to keep us working, make the day go by faster. But we had messages to tell us which way to go when to leave, who to follow, how to look at the sky, which side of the tree had moss growing to show you which side was, uh, to show you which direction north was. But when we go to the slave cabin, I'll be able to, but anyway, steal away. Listen to the lyrics of the song, steal away. Um, this music that evolved from the work songs and the songs of the Underground Railroad the music that evolved um, from Africa into the work songs, into the songs of the Underground Railroad, into ragtime and the blues, became the American music that we know today. We end our tour here at the West Baton Rouge Museum by saying that music is the ultimate expression of freedom. 
So as our ancestors were enslaved, it was humming and singing those songs that made their life and their work easier. And we end the tour here at the Juke Joint where we say music is the ultimate expression of freedom. <laughs>